We're going to now talk about quantifying learning. We spoke about linear classifiers just now and linear models in general. And I'm going to set aside the discussion on specific hypothesis classes and uh, you know, move to a more general discussion on what it means for a learning algorithm to be good. This is this kind of discussion is the becomes the crux of a machine learning because if we cannot do this, if we cannot quantify a learning algorithm's uh, ability to discover a true concept in some form or another, we are just guessing functions and testing them. So the goal, uh, the goal, one one goal of machine, one of the technical goals of machine learning is how do we rigorously quantify the performance of a learning algorithm? Uh, we can. There are few different approaches. And one approach here that uh, I'm going to use to illustrate a point is asking how many examples does the learning algorithm need to see before uh, we can guess that our hypothesis is good enough? Was there a question? Yes. Yeah. These were not online. These, these are not online. They will be uh, after the class. So the the goal here is to discover how many examples we need before we declare success. And the thing is, this choice, this, this uh, number that uh, we use, depends not just on the learning algorithm, but also the way in which the learning algorithm is going to interact with your data. So I mean, I, let me walk you through an example. Imagine that there is a hidden function. This function. Uh, that that we want our learner to discover, but we know what the function is. This function is a conjunction. In fact, it's more than a conjunction. It's a monotone conjunction. A monotone conjunction is a conjunction that has no negation. All the features, none of the features are negated. So a mono, a monotone disjunction is a disjunction where none of the features are negated. So imagine that there's a, uh, the learner needs to learn a true function, both the learner and we know that the two functions are monotone disjunction. What the learner does not know is which monotone conjunction is the true function. And let's say there are 100 features, but only five of them are relevant. The learner doesn't know that either. So there are only five relevant features, x2, x3, x4, x5, and x100. And now the question is this. Imagine an infinitely smart learner. How many examples should an infinitely smart learner need to learn this function from data? It turns out that this question cannot be answered without actually giving, without actually determining one more piece of information, which is how is the learner going to interact with data? So there are many ways in which a learner can interact with data. We call them learning protocols. One protocol is called active learning. The learner is not just given data and said, I told go figure. They said the learner can pick specific instances and say, what's the label for this one? And by choosing to construct those examples, it can try to minimize the number of questions it asks. At this point, we are essentially building a puzzle here. What's the fewest number of questions that the learner can ask to successfully learn the concepts? But this is one protocol. There's another protocol called teaching, where a teacher who knows the true function carefully constructs a data set consisting of the minimal number of examples that are needed for the learner and presents them to the learner and tells the learner, here, you don't need any other information except for this data set I've given you. And you'll, you'll be able to learn the function perfectly. A different protocol is the more sort of natural thing that we actually have which is there's a random source that provides training examples and the teacher labels all of them. So the choice of examples is not in the control of the, of the learner or the teacher. So the difference between the three protocols is who chooses the examples to be labeled. In active learning, the learner chooses examples that get labeled. In teaching, the teacher chooses the examples to be labeled. And in the third one, nature or some random source this example to be there. It turns out the answer to this question of how many examples are needed to learn the true function changes based on which protocol we are operating in. 
Let's go through this uh, one at a time. Let's uh, compare these three protocols. The first one is protocol one, which is active learner. The learner proposes instances as queries and uh, the teacher labels them. Now, in this case, if imagine that the learner knows something about the function somewhere in the middle of learning, it's in the best interest of the learner to construct a new, new question that forces the, the teacher to reveal new information about the function. Right? What's the point of asking a question to which the learner already knows the answer? So let's uh, let's see. Does that make sense? So uh, since we know that the, uh, we are after a monotone conjunction, the learner might ask the first question: What's the label for an example that has all ones and a zero in the last position? Remember the true function that, uh, that is this one here. So the learner asks, what's the label for the example for, uh, for this example that has all ones except a zero in the last place? And the teacher says, uh, applies the function and says, yeah, the uh, function value is false. It's zero. Why? Because x100 is necessary for the conjunction to be true. What the learner learns from this is all the features are present except for x100. I turned off x100 and the function value became false. That means x100 must have been it must be in the true function in the true function. Before I move on, any questions about this? This is the only sort of subtle point here, and I'll basically repeat this multiple times. So questions about what's going on. This, this is a game. This is a puzzle, if you will, where the learner has to discover the true function. We know we are after let's pretend that we know this for now let's not worry about that let's say that this is shared information between the learner and the teacher yes so we need to ask a hundred questions eventually yes we have to ask a hundred questions but the point is uh, is the meaning of this question clear? The question is really, is uh, x100 in the true function or not? If the label were false, namely, if the label is false here, because x100 is set to 0, uh, the, everything else is set to 1. x1 to x99 is set to 1 which means that they cannot make the function false. The only thing that could have made the function false is x100, which I have set to false. And the teacher says the output is false. That means the only conclusion is x100 is part of the conjunction. If the label were true, instead of f of x equals zero, if the teacher had said f of x equals one, that doesn't, that means that even though x100 was set to zero, the function value still remains one. That means x100 is not impacting the output. x100 is not in the feature, in the true function. So just with one question, I was able to, uh, the learner was able to know whether x100 is in the true function or not. This is just a complicated way of asking, is this feature present in the output, in the, in the, in the true function? I can repeat the same thing. I can construct a new example where I set everything to one, except for x99. x99 is 0, everything else is 1. And the teacher says, when x99 is 0 and everything else is 1, this function is 0. It, it's 1. Because x2 is 1, x3 is 1, 4, 5, and 100, they're all 1. So the output's 1. f of x is 1. The conclusion is f99, x99 is irrelevant and not in the true function. And I can keep doing this once for each feature. And at the end, I'll ask about x2 and x1. The only thing that's changing here is the position of the zero. And I've constructed 100 queries. I can ask, by, by asking these 100 queries, I can produce the hidden function exactly. So the, the learner basically asks for each feature, is it 
in the answer or not, and has figured out what the true function is. So there are 100 questions, 100 features, 100 questions. Any, any uh, questions or comments here? Oh, there are questions. Uh, the assumption in this example is that the true function is a conjunction. We just don't know which features are part of the conjunction. That's right. Uh, the assumption here is actually that, that the true function is a monotone conjunction, which means there are no negations here. All we do not know is which uh, features participate in this conjunction. And uh, in the protocol, the other question is in the protocol, the true function is uh, in protocol one, the true function is not known to the learner. In all the protocols, the true function is not known to the learner. The only information that the learner has is what uh, class of functions the true function belongs to. Um, other questions? I said that the true function is a monotone con uh, conjunction. It turns out that if you uh, if you do not have a monotone conjunction, if the true function is allows negations instead of x2, let's say you have not x2. Um, a very similar protocol will work, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you to come up with something. So that's protocol one. The short answer is in active learning for monotone conjunctions, you can discover the true function by asking as many questions as you have features and no more. There's no, there's no need to ask any more questions. Okay, let's consider protocol two. There's a teacher who knows the true function, who constructs examples and labels them and gives them to the learner and says, here are a set of examples. You don't need anything more than this. So what is the smallest set of examples that the teacher can construct? That's the question here. First, what the teacher would do is it would construct this example so we are working with the same function, the same function x2, x3, x4, x5, and x100. What the teacher will do is construct an example that has one in those five positions alone and zeros everywhere else. And says the label for this example is a one. Why? Because this is one, this is one, this is one, this is one, and this is one. It's a conjunction. So all of them are one, the outputs are one. So that this the teacher says. Here is a set of examples. Here, is, are the, here are the good variables. And then the teacher will prove that each of these variables is necessary by hiding one of them at a time. So in this case, it hides x2, meaning it sets it to 0. So here, remember that it's four ones and one one at the end. Here, it sets x2 to 0, and the label is 0. Setting x3 to 0 makes the label 0. I don't know why these red colors are so arbitrary x4 makes it 0, x5 makes it 0, x100 makes it 0. So the conclusion from each, the, the first one says we need at least x2, x3, x4, x5, and x100. This row says if you remove x2, the label becomes false. If you remove x3, the label becomes false. So you, it's not just you need at least those things, you need exactly those things. So this is almost like a necessary and sufficient condition. Uh, proof. The first one says these variables are sufficient. The second block says these variables are necessary. This means with exactly one, two, three, four, five, six examples, the true function can be conveyed to the learner. Teaching requires far less um, uh, complexity in terms of the amount of information that gets transferred from the teacher to the learner, as opposed to the learner deciding which is which functions to ask which are instances to get labeled. Teaching is far more efficient. Um, so this is like, you know, the, the straightforward, a very a straightforward learner will just use these six examples to produce the hidden function exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The order of magnitude of the number of examples will not change. It will you'll have to change the if you have negations, you have to change things like uh, in this case, we are still assuming it's a conjunction, it's a monotone conjunction. There are no negations. Yes. 
Unfortunately, even though teaching can be very, very efficient, um, modeling teaching is actually very, very difficult, it turns out. So this is pretty much the last time I'm going to talk about teaching. Let's go to a more sort of a natural setup. Nature picks the example. Uh, let's say nature picks these eight examples or yeah, these eight examples. Uh, the notation I have here is, uh, yeah, and and uh, the and nature or teacher, whatever, also assigns the label using the true function. So the notation is example, comma, label. So this is the example and this is the label. So these are eight examples are chosen by nature and given to the learner. And the learner is told, go figure. This is a, this is all the data you get. Um, uh, figure out the true function. And now the same question applies. How big should that data set be? Before this, we can give some guarantees about the learner quality. So let's say we have these eight examples. Turns out that there's a very, very simple algorithm that use, can use these eight examples to discover the true conjunction. The algorithm is called, it's so simple, it doesn't really deserve a name, but uh, it's called elimination. What you do is first discard all the examples that have, that have labeled false. Because a conjunction cannot be, we, we, we don't care about the, uh, the, the false examples. We are discovering a conjunction. And then you look at each column. In all the true, whenever the output's true, x100 is 1. So we know that x100 is in the true function. Whenever the label, whenever, uh, let's look at this column, x5 is 1 whenever the label is 1. So x5 should be in the thing. So you basically go one column at a time and find which features are always 1 in among all the examples that have the label true. And all of those features are present, at least those features are present in the true conjunction. Does this algorithm make sense? Can someone find a cause for complaint for this, for this process? That, uh, yes. I feel like we're going to have a lot of soft causes. Like that first row is in front of our teachers we care about. But first, we have to have all those. Wait, the first row? I'm sorry, the first column. First column. The first column is all ones. And the labels one. The learner, the elimination algorithm will conclude yeah, the X1 is part of the true conjunction. Is that a problem? So the elimination algorithm will pick a hypothesis that says that fun, the function that is present that's true is x2 and x3 and x4 and x5 and x100 and x1. Why? Because whenever the output's 1, x1 was 1. Based on this data set, it has no reason to reject x1 from the final hypothesis. Right? So you cannot, using only this information that's in these eight examples, you cannot discard x1. So, how bad is the problem? Whenever the output is 1, x1 is present. How could we have discarded it? On the other hand, notice that every one of the correct variables are present in the true function, in the learned function. So we have learned some sort of an approximation of the true function. It's not the exact thing, but it's an approximation. So the question is how good of an approximation is. With the given data, we've learned an approximation of the true concept. Can we be happy? Because we can't do anything more. This is all the data we have. Questions? Could you be happy with what could be wrong? What could go wrong if this thing is, uh, if X1 was part of the true function? And I'll give you an example. This seems very abstract. So let me give you an example that's more concrete here. Imagine that the true, we have an object detection system that's based on uh, some uh, parts uh, in a photograph. And I'm, let's say my true function is, does this image 
contain a bicycle? X100 is the feature that says, does this contain two wheels? X2 uh, is the feature that says, that does this contain a handlebar and uh, a saddle or a frame or whatever, each of those things. It's a separate detector. And I declare that the image contains a bicycle whenever uh, the image contains a handlebar and two wheels and a frame and all the things. X1 might be a feature that says, there's a road, whenever there's a road. It just so happens that every photograph of the bicycle was taken on a road. So there's no way to know using only the data that the road, the image pixels that correspond to a road are not part of the bicycle because they're always present. They're always correlated with the label. Is this a bad thing? So the answer is it's bad because we are adding some irrelevant features to the learned functions. So what? Uh, instead of eight examples, imagine you had eight million examples here. In fact, imagine you had instead of four positive examples, you had four million positive examples. Would it still be bad? Yes. Do when it comes to use the algorithm to identify bikes that weren't on the road. That's right. Anytime, if all, if your algorithm is going to be deployed, deployed only on bicycles that are on road, you'll never make a mistake because that feature is always going to be there. Instead of bicycles on the road, let's say bicycles on planet Earth. There's a X1 is the feature that says, is this thing on Earth? Probably most bicycles I know of are on Earth, right? So it's a, it's, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. So there are two ways to go about thinking, you know, formalizing this now. We can analyze this probabilistic intuition uh, that uh, you just uh, sort of illustrated. I never saw X1 equals zero in positive example on such a large collection of uh, data. Maybe we'll never see it. Maybe every bicycle is only going to be on Earth and uh, we don't have to worry about our classifier underperforming on bicycles on in space. So it's okay if that X1 feature, which is, is this on Earth, um, is, on, is present in the true classifier. And even if it does, it's such, it's going to be such a small fraction of cases that I'm willing to live with the error. This is uh, formalizing this intuition gives us what's called the probably approximately correct framework for learning, pack learning. There's another intuition. There's another way to analyze for the mistake driven model, which is we update our hypothesis every time we make a mistake. And we count success not in terms of uh, whether we got the true function or not, but how many mistakes we make over a long term. And once again, it's sort of a it's a similar sort of thing. You know, if this model is going to be deployed on data that's here, it's not going to make any more mistakes. So life is good. So mistake-driven learning essentially counts mistakes in and uh, then updates the mod, updates the, the 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 model, the hypothesis. And as long as we stop making mistakes, or as long as as long as we do not make too many mistakes, we declare that life is good. Yes. So would you need like a human in the loop or something like that? Which one? For the mistake driven learning algorithm? It doesn't have to be a human in the loop. It's just you need nature in the loop where there is feedback that's being given in the uh, in the learning loop. In fact, for now, we're going to focus on mistake driven learning. And we're going to spend some time on mistake driven learning. And then we'll talk about uh, come back to linear classifiers. When mistake driven learning meets linear classifiers, you get the perceptron algorithm. And we look at the perceptron algorithm and its variance. And then uh, we'll do a few other things. And then come after a while, we'll come back, we'll come back to this fact framework. The point of this lecture was there are two uh, things, there are really two points. The first one is asking whether a learning algorithm is good or not depends very heavily on how the learner interacts with the with data, with the true content. If it interacts in this active protocol, it can be super efficient. If it interacts 
in the teaching protocol, it can be even more efficient. And efficient is how many examples we have. In the supervised learning, traditional supervised learning protocol, protocol, we may not be able to be as efficient as active learning, but we have to kind of think a little harder to invent, to analyze the quality of learning. So we have to appeal to a little bit more theory. We have to build up this theoretical structure to understand the quality of learning. And these are these two different models for analyzing learning. There's a third one, Bayesian, which uh, we haven't, I haven't put on the slide yet. Actually, there are quite a few. There's uh, multiple models for understanding, for formalizing learning. We'll look at three in this, in this semester. Any questions about this? Questions on Zoom? Yes. How much data is enough to determine like data decision? Let's say we have uh, 200 bits of data. So and I give the machines five examples. It's, it's a yeah. very good question. So the question is, how much data is necessary to decide whether learning is done? Yeah. And the answer is, it depends on how difficult the true function is. It dep depends on your hypothesis phase. It depends on how you define done, how much error you're willing to live with. If I'm willing to live with very, very high error, I can stop learning very early, right? If I'm willing to uh, have my learner fail regularly, I can stop learning. So all of these things come into play. Learning theory essentially is this theoretical framework that combines all, all these different parameters into this one conceptual framework. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail when we get to that. 